So I'm Colton Flynn, and um, I like to think of myself as the, one of the geospatial gurus of the group. And so today we're going to talk about some of the geospatial methods we use to apply to manure sheds to better inform us for real world situations. So um, we take we use these spatial tools to inform us about real world using spatial representations. And we're going to talk about some of those spatial representations or tools that we utilize within geospatial analytics. And then I'm going to give two specific examples that we've done this already. I'm using um, and the examples being uh, the mega shed and distance to land application opportunities in Washington, which I saw some of you are from Washington. So um, hopefully you can even help us um, interpret some. Um, so some of those uh, tools that we're using are over here on the right. We're going to talk about rasters, vectors, and um, how we use them to represent the real world. So the first thing. Um, we're going to talk about are those spatial tools and we often are doing what are called aerial analytics or um, proximity to various phenomena. And we use geographic information systems or GIS um, to do these types of analyses. Uh, we use different uh, data forms, whether they be raster or vector. Um, on the left, you're going to see examples of rasters and on the right, you're going to see examples of vectors. Um, so if we're interested in a point, we're going to use an XY point. If we're interested in a line, you're going to have multiple XY points for the vector. Um, for the raster, this will be a cluster of cells that are lined together. Um, for an area, you're going to have multiple points that enclose, um, making what we call a polygon. And for a raster, it would be, a, again, a cluster, but closely knitted um, that would represent the area. And then for roads, it's similar to lines, but it's a network. Um, and we do the same um, for rasters. It's going to be like lines made up of pixels. And we're not really going to talk too much about um, surface elevation today, but I just thought I would um, share that in case uh, that is of interest to you. So for points, these are X, Y locations, and we often use these to represent county centers or livestock facilities. For lines, um, you have multiple X, Ys or coordinates, and we use this to um, represent Euclidean distance, which you can think of Euclidean distance as the, the, as the way the, cry, the crow flies. Um, so uh, the most direct distance. Um, and then we also use this for road center lines and streams for network analysis. Um, within polygons, we use polygons to represent things such as counties and buffers, buffers being a, a given distance around an object, lakes and fields. So the first um, example that I'm gonna give that we use these vector analysis are uh, is with the the mega shed. And here we're using polygons, lines, and points. The polygons represent the counties. Um, the, the lines represent the distances that we're going to talk about here shortly. And then the points are the center of the counties that we're often using or the edge of um, the clusters that we're going to talk about. So here you're going to see um, the bold uh, color counties are identified as source counties. And we cluster them together with this bold line that you see around. And then um, the sink counties are the lights, light colored counties that are around those bold. And what we're trying to do here is the goal, the overall goal is to redistribute nutrients from source uh, counties to sink counties. And um, how we do this is I like to think of it as those bold areas with the bold outlines are mounds of manure, okay? And then the, the light colored ones are, um, or transparent ones are buckets. And really the goal is to take those mounds of manure from these clustered counties and redistribute that manure as far as we need to, um, to make it flat. And also the aim of making these buckets full and flat. So really the idea of this mega shed is to have no more source, but break even here at the bolded areas and also breaking even amongst these counties. And we also use raster spatial tools for manure sheds. 
And you can think of rasters as cells or squares. And these cells are all the same size across the entire um, image or data set. And the cells are homogenous. And we often call cells pixels. And you can think of a raster as a grid and or image. There are three major types of rasters that we utilize that include raw in imagery, interpolated surfaces, and thematic maps. So raw imagery is um, pretty well known from like Google Maps. Interpolated means that we have like points of data and we use averages or some algorithm between given points to come up with what is probably happening between given points. And then um, thematic is the one that we're gonna be most interested in for the example today. So the most famous thematic map is probably National Land Cover Database. Um, today we're gonna be using what's called the CDL, but because the NLCD is um, more common, uh, I just wanted to give that as an example. We come up with this uh, from remotely sensed data, usually using a satellite called Landsat to determine um, crop data layer information. And those uh, within the NLCD, I showed the different categories that each of these pixels are representing across the entire US. I didn't show the uh, CDL here um, because there's a lot, there's over a hundred categories for the CDL. So we're gonna um, talk now about how we combine the use of vectors and rasters. And we're gonna talk specifically about the Washington Dairy System. Um, so on the left here, you have vectors and this is point data. And this is a representation of the 370 dairies that are within uh, the state of Washington. And on the right, you have two rasters, one in 2008 and one in 2019. And this is the crop data layer that we have resampled to represent just croplands, rangelands, other wildlands, et cetera, um, all the way down to de developed. And we have this data actually from 2008, 2009, 2010, all the way to 2019. And you're gonna see that in the next image. So the goal here is to determine around each of these um, dairies, how much land is available to uptake the manure from the dairies. So on the left over here, you can see multiple layers from 2008 to 2019. And again, these are the crop data layers representing um, these various um, categories down here. Each of the white points represent dairies across Washington. And then this uh, dash blue line is um, a theoretical distance that wet manure or dairy manure um, could travel to be uh, redistributed on lands. So in this study, we're interested mainly in croplands, but we also took a, a slight interest in, in rangelands to see if manure could be um, redistributed on rangelands. But there are caveats that come along with rangelands that include issues of runoff and um, things like biodiversity. Um, so uh, with that, you can see here in this first graph that Within those, if you took all of the um, land within those 18 uh, kilometers around each of the dairies, you can see that most often it's rangeland that could potentially be spread upon. Um, you do see some urban and some cropland that could, is also available. So then we were interested in um, the fact that the Cascades range actually runs right through here where this dotted line is. And we wanted to look at those uh, dairies west of the Cascades range and those east of the Cascades range. Um, so you can see down here, the dotted line represents those east and those west. And you can see in all, in all cases, except for urban, but for the rangeland and cropland, the West has a lot less land to be distributing manure nutrients upon. And this um, also causes some challenges because in the West, there are 205 dairies tightly clustered in comparison to those that are in the East of the Cascades range, which include 102 of those dairies. 
Furthermore, because the, the ones in the West are tightly clustered, there are some challenges associated with overlap of those 18 kilometer um, potential manure sheds. And because there's a higher overlap, which you can see here, um, those dairies would be um, challenging each other to be spreading or competing with each other to be spreading the, their dairy nutrients. Now, both of these examples that we gave you are um, theoretical, and um, there are caveats, as we suggested, with especially the rangeland spreading. But an important thing to look at beyond this are the social constructs. So I'll be turning it over to Gwinder to discuss those.